the ability to just share just the slide instead of all the other stuff I have. Anyway, I'm just going to move ahead. All right, guys. So the players. All right. Now, when you come to Lansing, you know, you think about, well, I might see Debbie Stabenow. No. Will I see Gary Peters? No. Will I see Mike Duggan? Eh, sometimes. Here are the players in Lansing. It's the state legislature. We have a house of state representatives. There's 110 members. We have a state Senate, and that's where people get confused. You know, you think about your U.S. senators, the folks that are working in D.C., but you have 38 state senators in Michigan. And so all total, there's 148 elected state legislators. And remember, the House and the Senate are completely different. Not completely, they're different bodies. They're not just one big blob. And sometimes they act like an older brother and a younger brother. Sometimes they don't get along. They have their own slightly different rules. Our constitution lays out how a bill becomes a law, but these two chambers take on different personalities from session to session. In addition to those 148 legislators, you know, there are 42 House and Senate standing committees and subcommittees. And in those committee rooms, you'll see 600 staffers at different, you know, there's office staff. Every caucus has a policy staff. Okay, Gene, wait, what's a caucus? Okay, well, caucus, what I use this term is House Republicans. That's one caucus. Senate Republicans, that's a whole different caucus. House Dems, Senate Democrats. And those four caucuses have their own policy staff because every legislator can't have the experts on staff and it, it's, it's the way it works. There are two independent nonpartisan um, agencies called the House and Senate Fiscal Agency. And you hear the word fiscal, yes, they do analyses of budget bills and that work, but they also do analyses of all sorts of bills. And then you have the administration that of course has to work collaboratively sometimes with the legislature. Now, um, it's really important to remember that this coalition, the Ecology Center, you know, another group that I've worked with the Michigan Environmental Council, these are nonpartisan organizations, right? We. Uh, but that doesn't mean we we still have to understand the politics of these human organizations that we're dealing with, this, this human thing called the state legislature. So what I like to say is we're politically savvy, but not politically pissy. We're not here to talk about whether you should be a Republican, whether you should be a Democrat. And, you know, remember, we want everybody in this coalition, we want everybody talking about childhood lead paint poisoning. So we wanna make everybody feel comfortable in our coalition. And when we get to meet to a state legislator, we don't care if they have an R Republican or a D Democrat after their name, because you know what? Lead poisoning affects every single legislative district in the state of Michigan, everywhere. This is the tragedy there is a lead poison child. Now, may not always show up on a map, you know, we know the maps and where there's an identified lead poison child, but uh, right now in the house, there are 58 Republicans and 52 Democrats. And that means that that is a Republican controlled chamber, the leader of the house, we call that person the speaker. Speaker Wentworth is a Republican. Every committee chair is a Republican. Every committee is comprised of a majority Republicans. Wow, that's pretty power hungry. If Democrats' the numbers were reversed, it would be the same thing. Because when you're in control, you structure the process. In the Senate, we have 20 Republicans, 16 Democrats, and two vacancies. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Those vacancies are in predominantly Republican areas. There are special elections coming up in August. And of course, we have one governor. And unlike the eight years before 2019, where we had a Republican House, Republican Senate, and a Republican governor, we have a Democratic governor. So for the first time in a long time, starting in 2019, we have a divided government. Now, um, when we look at the state legislature in Michigan, um, one of the things that voters decided back in the early 90s, and this is where I make a PSA, a public service announcement. This is Gene Doss, I hate term limits. I wish we had not done it, but we did. These are lifetime term limits. So. Um, an elect, and a state representative, he or she is elected to a two-year term. They can only serve three terms and they're out. That's six years. In our Senate, those individuals are lucky. They serve longer terms, four years, 
And after two of those four-year terms or eight years, they're out. And these are lifetime limits. Now, this, and, and you got to forgive me because I really was flying tonight. Um, it says here that 45 out of 110 members were freshmen at the beginning of this session. This is from, it, that actually was the beginning of 2019. Now, I want you just to think about it. I'm supposed to know legislators, and out of 110 state representatives in 2019, 45 were freshmen. I had it easy this year. Starting in January, at the beginning of the 21-22 legislative session, only 26, I think it was, were freshmen. And back in 2019, 30 out of 38 senators were freshmen. Now, the good news is some of those folks had served in the House. Um, I think that, you know, we start with relationship building. Uh, you know, everybody wants to know, okay, well, I don't really understand how the legislative process works, or what does it mean when there's a st draft substitute, or how do I get to this chair? You really want to start what you're doing with relationship building. And the best, you know, there's an old saying, the best time to make a friend is not when you need one. And the best place to always start, no matter where you live in the state of Michigan, is start with your own state legislators. You have two people that come to Lansing on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And whether you voted for them or not, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether they're from your political point of view, they're elected. And for the length of their term, they represent you. You don't have to walk into their offices and say, hey, you work for me. We can end screen, sh uh, screen sharing here. Um, you don't have to do that because they know that and they're actually hungry to hear from people in their district. You know, you have the most important issue that's coming through a budget or a policy committee and it's gonna impact kids all across the state of Michigan. A legislator may not get even one email or one phone call and so when you reach out to them, instead of feeling like, oh, this is scary, oh my gosh, they're gonna, they're gonna be, they may not say on the phone, like, oh, we're throwing a party, you're contacting us, but trust me, they want to hear from you. So today, what we're trying to do is talk a little bit about this relationship building and why it's so important and why legislators know you don't entirely understand how things work in Lansing. You don't have the secret decoder ring, they know that but they're there. And sometimes the first conversation doesn't have to be facts and figures or a bill or a budget ask. The first conversation, now this is, this is back in the day when we could meet each other. Um, the first conversation can be just as simple as this. Hi, I'm Jean Doss. I live at 2276 Hewlett Road in Okemos, Michigan. And you know, I'm not a single issue voter, but I would say my number one priority um, that I'm looking for action in this legislative session is really moving the ball and preventing and addressing childhood lead, paint, lead poisoning. That is number one important to me. And I would like to work with you on that, period. Now, why did I start by talking about my address? 2020 um, was an election year. I think you all remember that. And even though there was COVID-19 and even though we have all the social media and even though there's, you know, it's a whole different millennium, do you know how people get a win elected office? They still have to show up on your front porch. So chances are they know your address. If you're talking to your state senator or your state rep and you start out by giving them your address, don't be surprised if they say, oh, isn't that right by that quality dairy? Or are you by this school or I've got a cousin that lives a block over. Do you know so-and-so? Because they probably know your neighborhood as well as you do. Even in the middle of a pandemic, they had to go door to door, dropping literature, putting something on your um, your door, your not your uh, doorknob or tucking something next to your mailbox. And so it's always a good icebreaker when you're sort of sitting there and you're thinking, deer in headlights, what do I say? Start by saying, hi, here's my name. Here's my address. Thank you so much for meeting with me. See, see, you're almost there. Now, I'm gonna just take a quick break because there are some people on this call that know as much or more than I'm ever gonna know about advocating on childhood lead poisoning. And also they know about how the system works and I want people to jump in. How did you get started? What made it easy for you? Do you remember your first time? Anybody wanna jump in? Well, I will, and then hopefully some of our parents will. Um, I'm Mary Sue, and for a long time, I've been a lead advocate 
working with an organization in Detroit called ClearCore. And the first time I did this, I did it in Washington, DC. And I was completely intimidated. But then Gene Doss actually helped me understand that legislators never really see real people. They see lobbyists, they see like, they see Gene and Gene's colleagues. And when they see a real person from a real community with a personal issue, they love it and they pay attention and uh, they're less informed about the issue than we are. So we really do go in as experts. And um, if, if and when you're doing this lobbying, which hopefully many of you are doing on Lead Ed Day um, on the 27th, I hope, um, you'll be in a group and a lot of people in the group will have experience, but the person the legislator wants to hear from is you. So it, and it can be very fun and exhilarating after you've done it. So hopefully the people I know on this call, Minnie and Sierra and Tanisha and Tia, you'll all be helping do that. And I know Minnie and Sierra and Tanisha have talked at the Detroit City Council. So maybe any of you could talk a little bit about how that experience was. Uh, this is Minnie. I talked to uh, some of the city council because I know them personal, uh, like um, a district for um, Spivey. Spivey, I'm sorry, <laughs> I had a blank there. Yes, um, Spivey, yes, I know him very good. And so I was able to get, he haven't come, but he sent his um, peepers to the meetings. And so, um, and this year is an election year. So we can just about get whatever we want from these people now, because uh, if you tell them that you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna work for them, they will definitely be in your corner. And Ms. I, know Minnie, Ms. Doss, I know Ms. Doss know that too. <laughs> Ms. Minnie, tell us about the first time you talked to an elected official. Were you a little nervous? Oh, yes, I was. Oh, yes, I was. But, you know, I find out they just like I am. They just, they looking for the same thing. <laughs> and they looking for votes. They want somebody to work for them. And so you have to have them to work for you in order to, you know, for our organization. And so that's what I do. I try to get them to work for our organization. I know I rep that's up in Lansing too. You know, I worked for him when he was elected. Joe Tate. Oh, I, Yes, oh. I don't know if you know Joe or not. Mm -hmm. I love Joe Tate. Representative yeah, no. Joe Tate is fantastic. Yeah, he's very good. He's a very nice young man. And so he comes to my home a lot. And so, you know, we, uh, he, he said anything that he can help me do, you know, he would do it. But um, I haven't been able to get him to come on one of the meetings yet, but I will, I'll get him there. Yes. I'll let somebody else talk now. Thank you, Ms. Minnie. Anybody else want to share their first advocacy experience meeting with a policymaker and elected official? You know, I talked to the, the city council, but it's crazy to me because it's kind of sort of like natural. I wasn't intimidated. My, well, grandmother, my grandmother's a politician. Is she, Tanisha, problem child, Henry? I am the problem child. <laughs> that is exactly what she calls me too. But um, yeah, my grandmother's a state rep down in Mississippi. Oh, so and she laughs at me all the time because at any point in time, I'm liable to say anything, and I don't care who I'm talking to. I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. So. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, we're, we're going to come back to Ms. Problem Child Henry. Sarah Edgington, you wanted to share something quickly. Oh, I just, uh, I remember my first time and I think, I, well, I was extremely nervous, but I'll say this. Um, we were well prepared. I had Tabitha Williams um, and she's, she's an old hat at it. So she, she'd done it so many other times. And I think the thing that um, got me through the first time was that she said, you are a parent leader and in your community and you just remember that you have that power um, to, to take into those meetings and, and they're there to learn from you. 
And I, I think that that was like the best thing that she could have said to me because then I felt a lot more comfortable. Um, and then, you know, comment on, like the, the representative Henley, I think he was from Kalamazoo. Um, he had bulldog socks on and we talked about his dog first before we got like involved in, in any kind of other things. But it's, I think that, um, you know, when those representatives show up and you don't, aren't immediately talking to like their like workers or anything like that, that shows that they care and that they're committed and that they're really listening. So um, that's always something I find really interesting about that. And I'm, I'm kind of with Miss Henry. I, I, um, don't really care. I'm going to be blunt with them. <laughs> well, thank you. And you know what? You guys are just doing the training for us here. <clears throat> because before I wrap up my part, I want to, we're just trying to hit some of the basics. I want to pick up on something that Miss Minnie said. <clears throat> if you aren't able to meet with your elected official and instead you're meeting with their staff, don't feel like you've been blown off. Don't feel like you've been passed off. Um, and in fact, inside your heart go, oh, this is good. Because who do you think does all the work at the Capitol? It's the staff. Now, one thing I have to caution you, legislative staffers look, many of them look that they're about 16 years old. And you're gonna think this person is a chief of staff for a state senator who's chair of an appropriations committee. Okay, you keep that to yourself. Okay, those of you that say you say whatever you think, um, this is where you do keep your keep your thoughts to yourself <laughs> and put your put your bias to the side for a little bit because even though they're young, even though you're disappointed because you wanted to meet with your state senator state rep instead, this is an opportunity to have an in a more in-depth conversation with the person who may have a tremendous amount of influence over their boss. Remember, I don't know of any elected official at the state capitol right now that is an expert on childhood lead poisoning. Rebecca, is there anybody there that you would consider a specialist? No, I don't oh. think so. Got not so, a one issue person. <laughs> right, right. And they are, 99% of them are good people. 99% of them just wanna do something good for their community. But they're, some are attorneys, some are grocery store owners, some are moms. They, they come and they can't possibly know everything that comes across their desk in one day. To a, to a one, they will tell you their jobs, like standing in front of a fire hose every day. And you know, some of us say that for them, it's almost literal. I'm gonna hush up now and turn it back to Rebecca. Great, thanks, Jean. Um, so I think, uh, Jean, I don't know if you can stay, stick around for some Q and A or if we should, okay. Um, can you, after Mara's presentation or do you need to, okay. <laughs> Looking for the thumbs up. Awesome. So Mara's going, Mara Herman is a, um, our health policy specialist at the Ecology Center and she's stepping in. Our policy director isn't feeling well tonight. Um, some of the things in Mara's presentation are going to reiterate um, what Jean said and there'll be some new information too. Uh, just to let you know that we will be sharing the slides um, from, well, Jean will hopefully get yours um, from you and <laughs> um, we'll share Mara's slides and those will be up on the website. Uh, for both the fellowship, for the Health Leaders Fellowship, and the Lead Impacted Families. So two different places there. We are also, I should say, we're recording the presentation so that our fellows can watch these again in preparation from the, for the various lobby days that we, we have coming up. Dean, I'm sorry, we should have mentioned that before. If that's all right with you, we'll, we'll put our presentation up for our fellows. So, great. So Mara, um, if you want to take it away from here. Awesome, great. So before I get started, um, I don't know if I have the ability to share my screen or if someone else will be sharing theirs. So you should be able to. Okay, let's see. I looks like someone might have to make me host. But okay. while we figure that out, hi everyone. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Like Becca said, my name is Mara. I'm the health policy specialist at the Ecology Center where I have been working with legislators for about seven years now um, as a registered lobbyist for almost three. And I remember the first time I met with, oh, awesome, looks like I have abilities now, so I will swap up my slides. Um, and I remember the first time that I met with um, legislators back in, Jesus is like eight years ago now that I think about it. Um, and it was, 
I wasn't intimidated. I was a student and I remember thinking to myself, they just want to hear what I have to say. And I'm a student and they don't hear from students all the time. They're always hearing from the same handful of people. So that made me feel really good. And it was pretty true. Uh, um, I will say that they were pretty excited to hear from students. I think they were more excited to hear from me then than they are now. And now they're just really excited to see who I'm bringing along with me. Um, they love hearing from families. They love hearing from health professionals because like Jean mentioned, um, it's not who they're hearing from all the time. So that's kind of a big thing. So can you everyone see my screen? No. No? Let's see, let me try again. There we go. Awesome, we perfect, can. all right, great. And um, some of the first couple of slides that I have are gonna be things that Jean already mentioned. So it's gonna be a little bit of me kind of flying through a couple of things and just repeating a little bit here and there. So just to kick off, um, you can see here that we have um, a couple of pictures from the Capitol. So in the center, you actually see the Capitol building. On the left, we have the House chamber. On the right, we have the Senate chamber. And uh, Jean discussed this already, a little bit about the Michigan legislature, how things work there. They are paid. Um, we do have term limits. And we have the two chambers of the House and the Senate. Um, and when they're meeting full time, that means Tuesday through Thursday, they are in Lansing. Um, and then generally on Mondays and Fridays, that's when they're doing things inside of their district. Um, this is leadership for the current legislative session. Some of these names might look familiar to all of you. They might be your actual legislators, but um, this is always kind of a nice place to start if you're trying to get a sense of um, people who are in different positions and who are some folks you might want to be reaching out to to discuss different things that you're interested in and um, hearing more about what's going on at the Capitol. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the bill, the bill process and how we actually get something to become a law. So to kick things off, um, first things first, a bill has to be introduced and that's done by a legislator. And a lot of times what happens is a legislator is hearing from people, primarily people within their district about concerns that they're having. And that's when um, if a legislator is hearing it from enough people, what they'll do is then they will go ahead and introduce a bill. So once a bill is introduced, it's then referred to a committee. Um, Jean mentioned that there are lots of different committees that legislators serve on. Um, a lot of times things related to lead go to things such as health policy or natural resources. So then specifically the legislators that serve on that committee would be the first group that would be hearing about it um, and discussing the bill. So. Um, once a bill is introduced in a committee, they can do a couple of different things. Primarily what they'll do is they'll start out by holding um, hearings. Generally, they'll do a first hearing, um, which commonly is referred to as an evidentiary hearing where people are providing testimony. And that's a really great place where um, all of you can come in. And that's an opportunity to share information and stories and discuss why a bill should be something that they um, should be creating and putting into law or something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, so generally they'll have two of those. Um, the first two um, hearings are generally where they'll hear from people to provide expert testimony. Um, generally after two hearings, what they'll do is the committee can then do a couple of different things. So they can report the bill um, with the recommendation to either with supporting it or they're against it. They can also report the bill with amendments, but without any sort of recommendation whether or not it should move forward. Um, or they can reject and take no action on the bill. So that's kind of, they'll just, it'll just sit there. Um, and they can also decide that they don't want to report it out of committee. So they don't want it, they don't think that it should be moving further than that. And I noticed that there's a hand raise. I don't know if we are waiting to do QA at the end or if we are just going to have time to like have folks share questions. Um, it's up to you, Mara, really. Uh, we have time at the end too, but if you're willing to take questions as we go, we can go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it was Sarah who raised her hand. Sarah, do you wanna ask your question now? Hi, yeah. Um, I, I was just gonna ask you about this specifically because I know Rachel Hood, our um, 
She's our representative in our district. She put a bill out to the committee um, for for lead in our community. And I, how do we, first of all, how do we know where that is in the process? Because I can't seem to find it sometimes when I'm trying to keep paying attention to it. Um, and then also, um, sometimes it goes to specific committees like financial committee or something like that and it dies on somebody's desk how do we then put pressure on that person to bring that back up or like what how do we start the conversation of of asking them to maybe reconsider that bill um and bring it back alive or is when it like when it gets rejected or takes no action on the bill does that mean that it just is toast and there's no way to I mean, like, what are some things that we can do as advocates, I guess, maybe? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And I'd like to open this up to a couple of other folks on the phone to see if they have any experience specifically with that happening. Um, and maybe if anyone has any examples that they'd like to share. Oh, I see that there's something in the chat as well. And um, looks like Becca put in a link where you can actually look up the status of bills. That's always really helpful. Um, sometimes... It just depends. So for example, um, if there's a lot of bills that have been introduced in a particular committee, it might just take some time for that bill to come up as an issue to be discussed. Um, other times, you know, um, it can also take a while for an actual bill to be introduced. So Sarah, I don't know specifically with uh, Rep Hood, if the bill has been actually introduced yet, or if that might still be in the, the process. That could also be another reason, um, but then it's also important that you can always reach out to folks who sit on a particular committee and uh, try to urge them to have a hearing about a bill. Is there anything else anyone would like to add on that? Yeah, Rep Hood has actually uh, introduced it because we went to Lansing to show support, but then as far as I know, nothing has been done, and I think it's died in committee, and I've asked her a a couple of different times about it. So, and then I know that like, as um, you know, it's local state and then federal is how this process moves instead of vice versa. Um, so I know in the federal, there's a bunch of bills that are around lead that is, has also been tanked too. So I don't know how we drum up support to get that to, to move in a direction, you know. Mark, do you want me to, <clears throat> Can I add a few things? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so Sarah's bringing up a really important point, and um, which is that there are many, many bills introduced. You know, remember the time frame you're working in is a two-year legislative session. So we're in the 2021-22 legislative session. If you turned on a basketball game, you'd want to know who's playing. You'd want to know the who's what's the score. Well, what else would you want to know? You'd want to know how much time is left on the clock, and <clears throat> bills are introduced every day during those two years, but in the end, which will be December, let's just say, we don't know the precise date, but probably December 17th, something like that, 2022, all bills that haven't gotten all the way through the legislative process and sent to the governor's desk for her signature, veto, whatever, die. And the, the system is set up to make it very hard to pass bills. It's really easy to kill bills. And there'll be six four or five, 6,000 bills introduced every two year session. So Rep Representative Hood's bill is competing for time and attention. And a lot of times bills die, not because anybody opposes them, but because nobody has made them a priority for action. Mara, does that help? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Yeah, that actually helps a lot. So how do we make that, I guess, I know that's like the magic question, right? But how do we make that a priority? <laughs> well, let's, let's let Mara well, continue yeah. and then we can come back to that. I was going to say, yes, um, there's going to be a couple of slides that will discuss a little bit about that. So I think um, there's a couple of ways that we can talk about that um, a little bit later in this presentation. But thank, thank you so much, Sarah, for bringing this up. This, it's a really good point that um, comes up a lot. Okay, there we go. All right, so I mentioned committee hearings and that's where we actually um, are seeing when committees are discussing bills. And I talked about people coming in and providing testimony. So there's a couple different ways in which that can be done. So one of the easiest ways that you can show support 
or opposition of a bill is to fill out a tiny little card. Um, what you do is you kind of, you put your name, you put your address, um, there's a, you can check boxes that say, um, you know, I'm in support of, or I'm in opposition of a bill. And then, oh, Jean's holding one up right now, I see. <laughs> Great. Um, and then it also has the opportunity where you can um, check out a box that says whether or not you like to speak. So if you say, you know what, not today, I don't really feel like speaking, you can just say no, then that card will be submitted. They actually tally up cards. They say how many they have of support um, and opposition of, and they'll read off your name. And then everyone that's on the committee will hear that. Um, if you decide that you do want to speak, um, they do provide the opportunity from people who are in the audience to give a couple of minutes of comment. So you could do that as well. Um, formal witness testimony is, other, is another option. I know that there's some folks on this call who've done it in the past. I've done it as well. Um, it can be a little scary the first time that you do it um, because you do know that legislators do have the opportunity to ask you questions. So you just wanna make sure that you're prepared. Um, you can have your written testimony as well in front of you and you can also submit it to them so that they have something to take away from, um, what, from what you were sharing. And um, it's a great opportunity to share some insight and some expertise and share a little bit of your story and why a particular bill means so much. Um, and if speaking in front of the committee is just something that might be a little too much for you at the moment, or maybe it just doesn't work time-wise, you can also submit written testimony. And that's really great because everyone on the committee has it there, they can read through it, um, and they have some time to really digest all of the information that you're sharing with them. And I know there's a couple people on the call that have done this in the past. Um, I've also helped a lot of our fellows create written testimony on um, a, a couple of different bills, specifically last year um, on some bills related to lead. And so that's also a great way to get involved and share your expertise and your story with legislators when they're discussing potential legislation. All right, so the bill process, um, getting, this is a little bit farther down the line, you'll have general orders in your second reading. Um, if things would keep going after the second reading, the third reading usually happens pretty quickly afterwards. Um, that's if you're really getting some momentum um, and then you'll have your final vote. Um, once you have your vote, it's sent over to the other chambers. So for example, if you start in the house, then it's sent over to the Senate and the process starts all over again. I noticed we have something in the chat and, oh great, yeah, so Beck is just letting everyone know that when it comes to testimony, you can uh, send it in via email. And so then printed copies, um, you can also bring those with you as well. So that's always a great thing to know. Um, so if you get to the point where both chambers have um, come to a consensus that this is something you wanna move through, you, move through, you also wanna make sure that there's um, the same language. So you can't have two different bills in, one, in each of the chambers and th them not be exactly the same. So sometimes there'll be a little bit of um, time that they need to take to make sure that um, they get all the little details taken care of um, and make sure that everything is the same. But if you get to that point where you have congruent bills, everything is up to go, uh, majority of people are on board, um, then it is sent to the governor. Um, and then the governor has 14 days for consideration of what they want to do. So um, if they just decide, yes, this is great, this is something I wanna sign, then it becomes a law. Um, sometimes what will happen is that it gets onto the governor's desk and they say, no, this isn't something that I think should be a law and they can veto it. Um, if that does happen, it is sent back to the legislature. They have the opportunity to override the veto with a two thirds vote. Um, and then the bill would become a law even without the governor's um, support. So that's kind of a quick and dirty overview of the bill process and what it takes for a bill to become a law. Um, but really, we're gonna be talking a lot more about different ways to engage. Sarah, I think this is really gets to your point about how do we get momentum and how do we get support for different topics? And here's a couple of different ways to do that. So social media is a big one. A lot of legislators are on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram, it's also a great way to get other people involved um, and get the word out so other people um, are then activated and engaged. Um, same thing with letters and doing opinion editorials. 
It's a great way to get the media involved, get a little bit of buzz around a particular issue. Um, that's a great way to also get things um, kind of in the face of legislators, because if they're hearing a buzz, if they're hearing from more people who live in their district, um, that's always a great way to kind of say like, hey, this is something you need to be really working on. Um, I mentioned we talked about testimony already. Sign on letters are great as well. Um, that's something that you can even submit when they're talking about bills. Um, I just noticed there's something in the chat, but I noticed it's not um, a question, so we'll keep moving on. Um, phone calls. I know it was mentioned before that sometimes that um, something will be discussed and legislators only hear from like one person. A great way that you can show your support for something is just calling your office. Legislators have staff who are really um, in charge of doing some outreach and engagement with the community. And if you're calling in and letting them know, hey, this is something I care about, that's a great place to get started. Um, they also hold coffee hours where those are generally held in district. I know a lot of legislators have been doing them via Facebook um, and doing different town halls and public hearings. That's another great way to have the opportunity to talk to them, get something on their radar and build that relationship. So maybe you don't have a particular issue you wanna to talk to them about yet, but you really wanna get some face-to-face -face time, start hearing more about what they care about, seeing um, ways in which the two of you can collaborate with one another. Um, press events are another opportunity. I mentioned already getting the media involved. This is another great way to kind of get things out to the public and getting other people involved. Um, volunteering, I heard, some I heard some folks talking about how they volunteer with legislators in their campaigns. Um, action alerts and petitions, signing on to those, hearing what's going on. Um, obviously meeting with your elected officials, which is what we'll be doing with the Michigan Alliance for Lead Safe Homes Day, and then voting. Um, and helping make sure that we have people in office who really care about the issues that you care about. So a couple of different ways to get in, to engage um, and get involved. So moving on, um, I wanna talk a little bit about your strategic plan. Um, Sarah, I think this will also kind of touch on a little bit of what your question was as well. So really um, you wanna start off with what is your legislative goal? What is it that you're hoping to accomplish? Um, sometimes it might not even be that you want to get actual legislation passed. Maybe you just want to raise awareness and let people know like something is going on and that they need to be paying attention. Um, so you always want to keep that in mind as well. Um, who will your legislative champions be? I mentioned before that you have to have a legislator introduce a bill. Unfortunately, I'm sure a lot of us have some great ideas of some bills and legislation we'd like to see passed, but since we're not a legislator, we can't do that. Um, so we want to have an idea of who are some legislators you can call on to introduce a bill, but then also maybe help, you know, get other legislators interested in it um, and make sure that it's something that when it does get introduced and it is given to a committee, um, people are paying attention to it and really taking it on as an issue to discuss. Um, a little bit farther down in the process, um, which committee will hear your bill? That's always an important thing to know because then you can target specific legislative offices to meet with, to discuss the issue and say, hey, we need to have a hearing. This is something you all need to be taken up um, and talking about. Um, and then again, farther down the line, how many votes do you have or need? That would be when they're actually voting on it. Um, should you do a press conference and editorials? Is this something you wanna be creating a buzz about? Do you wanna get more people involved? Do you want um, you know, the media covering it and making it something that's getting more attention. Um, who are your allies and your opponents? Who are other people you can call on to be supportive? Um, there's safety in numbers. If you can show that there's a lot of people interested in a particular issue, that's great because then you can kind of spread out and you can hit and talk to more offices. You can get more things done. Um, and you also wanna know who your opponents are. You know, why might they not be on board with this? Are there compromises that can be made? Are there particular issues that you can kind of work on and figure out now um, so that it won't be a problem down the line? And um, in the end, one thing you'll wanna consider is will the governor sign your bill? Because like I mentioned before, they do have veto power. So you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, that's a lot. <laughs> um, where do I get started? And one of the best things you can do, and Jean talked a little bit about this, is meeting with your legislators during session. Um, legislators are really busy, so you always want to try and set up your meeting with a legislator as early as possible, because that way you can get on their calendar. Um, 
easiest way to do that is just by calling their office and talking to their staffer and setting up an appointment. And if you're a constituent, that's always an important thing to um, share when you're making that meeting because like it's been said already, legislators love talking to people who live in their district. They love talking to people in general, but they really love talking to people who live in their dis district because those are the people who really understand the community that they live in. Um, I mentioned that they are pretty busy, so don't get discouraged if you end up meeting with staff. Jean already mentioned before about term limits and legislators are only in their position for a certain amount of time, but staff can be there forever. And they're really the ones that have some time to really dig into some details and legislators really rely on their staff for input when it comes to making decisions. Um, and then you can always pull a legislator off the floor. Obviously, this is pre-COVID times. Um, this is kind of how things would work. Um, outside of the House and Senate chamber, you could fill out a little card asking for a legislator to come out and talk to you. And um, it, was, it was always really easy. They would come out. You could kind of shake their hand, say hello, let them know that you stopped by their office, um, say a couple words about what you were there to talk to, talk to their staff about. And then say, you know, oh, I can't wait to follow up with you. I can't wait to continue on meaning to talk about this issue. Um, all right, a little bit more about conducting your visit. This really is something that you'd want to keep in mind, whether you're meeting with them in person or if you're meeting with them uh, via your computer. Um, showing up on time and being dressed appropriately, um, those are big key pieces. I mentioned that they're really busy, so you might only get like 15, 20 minutes with them. You want to make sure you're there on time so you can really take full advantage of that time you have with them. And you want to start on a positive note. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. I'm really excited to speak with you. Something to that effect. Um, having a brief presentation and um, having an agenda, of specifically things you want to talk about and stick to it um, is really important because you only have so much time, but also legislators can be a little chatty. And they might go off on a couple of tangents. So you really want to be there and understand like specifically what you're there to talk about. So if you do start talking about other things, you can kind of bring them back to the matter at hand. Personalizing and localizing your issue is key. This is probably the most important part is really sharing your story, talking about what it's like to be a health professional, talking about what it's like being a parent. Um, these are the things that legislators really need to hear and the things that are really going to stick with them. Um, I've been in a lot of meetings with legislators and I can you know, spit out a bunch of data at them, but then I turn to one of my colleagues who's a nurse, or I turn to one of my colleagues who has someone in their family that's been impacted by lead, and that's the person the legislator remembers and really um, has questions for and wants to hear more about what they're experiencing because that's really important for them to hear. Um, then you really also wanna give the legislator some time to talk. Um, like I mentioned, not too much. And having a specific ask ready. Um, this is always something that people are sometimes like nervous about doing, but I always say it's really important. Um, there's been countless times where I've done a training and I have a great little group of advocates and I send them out to their meetings and they come back and they talk about how they had a wonderful time and the legislature was really great and the conversation was awesome. And I ask them, well, where does the legislator stand on your issue? And they say, well, I don't know, I didn't ask. Well, you had a great meeting and you built some rapport with them, but you don't know where they stand on the issue. And even if you're unsure and you're not really, you know, maybe you're thinking like they're going to say no, still ask because you never know and that's always a great way to kind of like have more of a conversation and, you know, dig into some details. Um, telling the truth. Sometimes they might ask a question that you just don't know the answer to. And that's okay. That's an opportunity for you to say, you know what? That's a really great question. I'm going to get back to you with some more information on that. Um, and that's a great way to keep, follow up with them and keep the conversation going as well. Um, and then lastly, you want to end on a positive note, just like you started out with. And... Um, follow up with any materials that you um, promised that you would, and a, a thank you is always great as well. So digging a little bit more into details on meetings, um, first things first, you want to prepare prior to any meeting. So um, targeting key legislators, great place to start is with your own legislators, and then maybe if something has been introduced to a committee, 
some folks who sit on that committee um, and doing your homework and coming prepared. So there's a lot of information about legislators that you can find on their websites um, and some of the directories. Um, take a minute or two and just read through that. Um, you get to learn a little bit about their background, what they were doing before they were a legislator, maybe a little bit about their family. And that way you can kind of have an idea of like where you can connect with them. Um, my former representative, I would always go in and the first thing he would always ask are how are my parents and their dogs? Because he always saw them walking around the neighborhood with their three dogs. And, you know, sometimes I was like, Frank, we only have 10 minutes. I don't have time to talk about my parents' dogs today. But it was always great because that's the kind of stuff that really helps frame a conversation and makes it feel like I'm just here talking to another person. Um, you'll also want to have some materials prepared for your meeting. So, for example, for the Michigan Alliance for Lead Safe Homes um, day that we'll be doing, um, we will have some facts that and some materials that share more information about data and things about lead in the state of Michigan. So um, having things like that are really great. And then of course, you'll also wanna make sure that you provide your contact information because sometimes um, legislators will reach out to you specifically if they have questions or if they need someone to talk about an issue um, in a different meeting or just having someone that they can rely on for information. Um, so then when you actually have your meeting, you want to be precise. I mentioned a couple times that you might only have a, a short amount of time with them. So you want to get to your point and stick to it. That's really important because you want to have enough time to really make sure that they have a, a good idea of what it is that you want to accomplish. Um, never take anything for granted. You know, they, they're taking the time to speak with you, but also really ask them for their support. That's really important because sometimes they surprise you. You know, you think a conversation might not be going so well, or maybe they're not really interested. And then you ask them and they say, yeah, of course. Or yeah, what is it that I can do to help? And so that's, that's always great. And having clear objectives, that always helps keep you on track, making sure that you're covering all the points that you really wanna um, share with them. Um, other things to keep in mind, um, being professional. Um, first thing you want to do is walk in and introduce yourself and who you're there representing. So, for example, when I go in, I'm Mara and I'm with the Ecology Center. Or when I'm doing advocacy days with other groups like the Michigan Alliance for Lead Safe Homes, I'm Mara and I'm with the Michigan Alliance for Lead Safe Homes. And we are here today to talk to you about lead poisoning in the state of Michigan. Um, be assertive and don't be intimidated by them. They work for all of you and they're just people. Um, and they really need your input to help them make some good decisions and so that they're, they're making educated decisions. It's really important. Um, and it's also important to remember, don't take rejection personally. Um, it's not because of you that they're saying no on a particular issue. Maybe, um, who knows what it could be for, but it's definitely not because of you or anything that you said. Um, other things I mentioned already, politeness and being cordial, um, no need to preach to them and no one to back off. Every once in a while, you'll get uh, a meeting that, you know, isn't going exactly the way you want it. I will say that generally doesn't happen very often, especially when it's coming, the um, information is coming from, you know, community members and parents and health professionals. Those meetings tend to go really well. Um, but it is important to remember to be tolerant of different viewpoints. Sometimes you're just not going to see eye to eye on a particular issue. And that's when it's really important. I know we had a couple of folks say that uh, sometimes they'll just say what they want to say. Um, sometimes it's just important to keep those thoughts in your mind and wait until later to say anything because you don't want to bad mouth a legislator. Um, they could be your ally next time around. Sometimes an issue kind of changes in their mind. Um, they have new information and then they're on board with you um, farther down the line. So um, great ways to kind of frame your meeting and your messaging. First things first, you have your elevator pitch and your introduction. So you wanna be short and sweet to the point, introduce who you are, who you're there representing, um, really capture their attention. That's when Jean mentioned, you know, saying what her address is. So they immediately know where she lives. That's always a great way to get their attention um, and make a connection with them. And then describe the purpose of your meeting. 
then you'll want to go in and uh, state your position. So for example, I'm concerned about lead poisoning in the state of Michigan. I want Michigan to do A, B, C, and D. Whatever that may be, um, you'll want to share that. And if there's any data or information that you can really use to help back up your position. Um, the big goal here is you want to motivate them to take some sort of action. You want this to be something that they really want to take on and be supportive of. And then, like I said before, this is the big key piece. It's really telling your story. Why does this issue matter to you? How does it impact your own family, your students, your clients, patients, people in their community? That's really what they need to hear. Um, those are the big things that they'll take away from the meeting. And at the end of the day, a lot of legislators, they just wanna make sure that people who live in their communities are safe. And so this is a really important thing that you're sharing with them to say, hey, this is something that needs to be addressed so that we are helping other people be safe. And then just to close things up, you wanna make sure you have your ask and then thanking them for their time and making yourself available for follow-up questions. Um, and then making sure to follow up with them. Another thing that I wanna note um, is that taking notes during your meeting, um, that's always great. That one way it'll help you remember um, any key details that they might have shared. Um, it's also a great way that it reminds you of, oh, I said that I would follow up with them with this material or answer this question. You'll have it all right that down there and that way you won't forget it. Um, and again, just persevering, following up. Um, if there was particular information that they asked for or that you said that you would share with them, be sure to do it in a, a timely manner. Um, I generally like to do it the same day if I have time or maybe the next day and that way I don't forget. So it's fresh in my mind, but it's also fresh in theirs. And then um, cultivating relationships with legislator staff is also really great. Um, they are in charge of the books. They're the ones who are reading a lot of information that's coming in. And Amy, I see that your hand is raised. Do you have a question? I do, thank you. Um, so I have a question about how you would have a have a conversation with a legislature legislator who definitely has the very opposite opinion of your agenda. Um, because I had that with a representative today, actually. <laughs> Um, in a meeting. And um, so it was interesting to navigate that with um, with my cohort who I was meeting him with. And um, I'm just wondering if you have any tips on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I guess it, it's kind of a case by case basis. Um, sometimes legislators want to hear more about um, the facts and they want some data to back things up. And so you kind of have to pivot and talk less about maybe your personal experience and more about you know some hard numbers. Um, or a lot of times um, when it comes to funding or costs associated with something, that's always something to kind of talk about. Um, but then also kind of asking them the question of like, you know, well, what would it take to get you on board with this? That's something that um, some legislators are more open to than others. Um, Unfortunately, I wouldn't say there's one way of going about doing things with every single legislator. It kind of depends who you're talking to. Um, anyone else on the phone have any suggestions of ways in which to handle those types of situations? So the one thing I was gonna say, um, well, particularly in lead, we, you know, tying it back into like a monetary reason often at least gets people going if it creates jobs or something or saves money, I think would be like the best thing that we've done and also when it relates back to children because it's hard to be like well at least nobody outright will be like nah we can't really care for the children um not that it will convince them but I think those are the two tactics we've used a lot when talking to people who don't support necessarily what we're doing yeah I think that when you run into somebody who opposes you think of that as a real gift because one of the strengths of your campaign is anticipating opposition and, and one of the things that's hard for us is we think, who could disagree with us? So when somebody actually takes the time to explain that they oppose it and here's why, that's a gift. It doesn't feel like it at the time. And what I would do is restate. So your concerns about the bill and restate back so that you're really clear that you're understanding why. And 
you know, be it, try to be very respectful. And, you know, there are some times where it's just, you're not going to move that person, but this is key. I want to thank you so much for meeting with you, meeting with us. I see that we disagree on this issue, but I look forward to working with you on other issues in the future. Thank you so much. That preserves the relationship. You're not burning any bridges. You're leaving a fantastic impression. And, you know, the person may, next time you come to the person, they may think, oh, they were so nice. I couldn't support them last time, but maybe I can try to support them this time. But the most important thing is to really understand the opposition because the name of the game is compromise. And what you're trying to do is understand what their problem is. And then you go back. You don't think it through in the middle of the meeting. You go back to your coalition and think, is there some way we can address his or her concerns, neutralize them without losing the core objective of our bill? So it, it doesn't feel like a gift, but it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. All right, thank you for that input. That's always really helpful information to keep in mind. And then um, just to kind of wrap up things, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking specifically on how things have changed now that we've gone fully virtual. Um, and since our next big Lansing day won't be completely virtual. Um, so this is kind of uh, things that, to keep in mind when you're getting ready to set up a meeting with a legislator um, that I've already kind of covered. Um, this has all been taken care of by the Michigan Alliance for Let's Safe Homes. So you don't have to worry about any of these things and we will be using Zoom for those meetings. So no worries there. Um, but a couple things to keep in mind um, before your meeting, ensure that you're set up for the meeting in, in a quiet place. That way you'll be able to hear the legislator, they'll be able to hear you and you don't have to worry about any other outside distractions. I know that some things can just be out of our control, but if you kind of go into that mindset and try to set yourself up for success, um, hopefully things will go better for you. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is dress up for your online meeting like you were attending in person. Um, now that we've been in kind of the Zoom world for the past year, I'm sure we've all seen those videos of snafus of when, you know, someone wasn't wearing pants on their meeting and everyone knew it. Um, so just to keep that in mind, um, to dress appropriately, and that we don't have to worry about that. Um, sending materials in advance, I believe um, the Michigan Alliance for Lead Safe Homes will be sending materials in advance, so legislators will have some of that already. Um, and then you can always prepare a couple of slides for sharing during the meeting if you'd like. Um, that's always a great way too, because then it kind of has your agenda, your objectives, and kind of helps keep everybody on task. Let's see. Um, I see one about having cats on calls. I personally love seeing people's pets. Um, if you can maybe keep them until the end, because the last thing you want to do is have everyone be distracted by how cute your pet is. And then you kind of lose control of the meeting and you, you don't get to all the things that you wanted to talk about. Um, but with that, let's see, there we go. Um, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to Becca and the host capabilities too. Great. Um, so what we want to do uh, now, and we'll come back for a few questions, but I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for this, is to um, break out and practice a little. Um, so I'm sharing my screen and we'll chat this information out to you in your breakout rooms as well. Um, but essentially in small groups, um, and Tanya is going to be putting you in those small groups soon, um, you'll practice um, as if you are in a lawmaker meeting to share um, information or your story about why, in this case, lead and protecting children from lead is important to you. It's okay, you don't have to be polished. This is just amongst us as friends. So make sure you, that you introduce yourself and then go ahead and dive into your story because we don't have a lot of time. Um, the staff from the Ecology Center, Access, um, Healthy Homes Coalition of West Michigan um, and Center for Urban Studies will be the mock lawmakers in this case. Um, again, we, we don't have a lot of time because this was really terrific and we took some questions during it. So I we're gonna chat this information out to you. 
um, how lead impacted your family or your clients, if you're a health professional or something that you uh, feel very comfortable talking about with. Um, and please do introduce yourself to the rest of the folks in the group. Uh, Tanya, do you wanna break us out into our groups? Yes, I'm about to activate the breakout rooms and it should automatically send you uh, to your room. If you're on a phone, it might give you like a prompt that you might have to click yes or no, um, but it'll give you a countdown before we bring you back into the regular room and then it'll automatically bring you back here in just a couple of minutes. So Rebecca, how long? Five minutes? Uh, about five minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but we wanted to make sure we got the rest of the information out to you and then um, about the next event. So I am going to share my screen and then we'll come back to questions, um, assuming we have some time. So um, it looks like y'all can see this. Is that right? The next events. So the next lead event that we've been talking about um, is the Lead Education Day from the Michigan Alliance for Lead Safe Homes. Um, that is an event that you need to register for specifically. Um, I know that some of you already have. Um, if you haven't, I urge you to do so ASAP. The deadline for that is Monday. Um, the link is right there. Um, so we can, we've also sent that out and we'll send it out again to you all. There's also a webinar that is being organized um, to do more specific training in terms of the talking points for that day. Some of it will be, um, you know, a, a remi reminder of what we've learned about today, but the specific talking points on the policies will be new. So I encourage you to um, participate in that or at least to register. You don't even have to um, do it. It's, it's during the workday. So I know that can be challenging for folks, but they will send you a recording so you can watch it on your own time. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have our spokesperson training um, for our um, families that are in our lead impacted families training program, not yet our health professionals program that comes later. Um, and that is, we'll be sharing your story with different audiences. So thinking about the media or lawmakers and those or others. Um, and those events are May 13th and 20th from 5 to 6 p.m. Again, this is for our families that are in the lead um, impacted families training. Um, we will have a similar event for health professionals that will be down the road a bit. Um, again, for our lead impacted families, um, we have our schedule of re remaining events. You don't need to take notes on this. Um, we have this information up now on our new web page, um, and we will be sending you these slides. Um, so I wanted to just put these out there. Again, this information will be emailed to you. Um, so our new web page that you all can look at, um, ecocenter.org slash lift um, for the impacted families. You can see the recording and the slides from our first presentation on April 1st, where we talked to the LED 101 and talked about the main issues there. And then you can also see that schedule of events. Um, there are other pages. There will be a, a page um, for each event and where you can see the recording, like today, you'll see the recording of this presentation um, and other things like that. Um, and then for everyone, um, I'll put this up here while we move on to our questions and answers. Um, so there will be a poll that'll pop up on the screen pretty soon. Tanya will put that out there um, for how do you feel about tonight's session? Um, so. Um, feel free to put your answers in there. And then if there's anything you'd like to chat out to us that you'd like to learn in your next sessions, please do that now as well. Um, but in our you know, last moments here, I wanna just thank our speakers, Mara and Jean. Jean had to step, um, step away for the evening, um, but also just to turn it back over to all of you. Thank you for participating and find out if there's any questions you have on your way out. I got a question. Great, go ahead. So you guys have been around me a few times. I seem to intimidate people, so that's why I crack jokes a lot. Mm -hmm. Because most people are intimidated by me. Because I'm very blunt. I happen to be six feet tall, like 300 pounds. I happen to be a very large woman. 
you know, so a lot of people are intimidated. So my humor, am I going too far? No, I think it's okay. Yeah. I think that when what Mara was saying, and Mara, you can correct me, like, it's okay to be direct and blunt. You just, you know, we always have to mind, mind our manners with the lawmakers because, yeah. So saying, you know, what's on our minds is relevant. These are really important issues, but not bad mouthing anybody yeah. because, you know. Yeah, but see, I bad mouth them outside of the office. <laughs> and, a little, and a little bit of humor is good. But, you know, you, you know, time and place. Tanisia, you know time and place. Absolutely. I always have. <laughs> right. We've talked. So I just want to uh, thank Rebecca for putting this together. It's, it's a great session and, and everybody that helped. And also just encourage everybody, please, to sign up for Lead Ed. We call it Lead Ed Day on the 27th because everything we practice today we'll be using there. And so yeah. let's take advantage of what we learned. And um, you can you can be on only one or two calls. You can do it all day if you want. Um, but we need to tell our legislators that um, that we're serious about lead. And this is a great opportunity to do that. Great. I see another hand up. Is it Khalif? Sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Your name. Yeah. I just want to. I just want to know that how can we figure that out that our in our home have led or not? Uh huh. So, um, so that's one of the things that we talked about last time, and um, one of the things that we're putting together is an information packet that we're going to be um, sending out to to folks. So I know we've talked about this before, and there is information about where lead might be found in the home. Um, and we can put more information or answer questions because it depends on the community you live in, in terms of, you know, who you might reach out to to get your home tested and things like that. So that's a really good question. And then I see in the chat, there's a question from Angela about wanting to make sure that prepared. Sorry, go ahead, Khalid. Really? Yeah, sorry. Uh, where can I able to get the uh, test in the home? Mama. Like, with, uh, Mama. to home, I can able to call and ask them, I want to test it my home. Is it lead or not? Where do you live, uh, Khalid? Where do you live? I live in Taylor. So we can, we can get you the number for Wayne County Health Department. And you can talk to them because they may be able to help you even get a grant. Okay. Or actually, if I can, I can follow up with you if you like to. Yeah, sure. Okay. That would okay. be great. Thank you. <laughs> and then I saw there was a question in the chat from Angela about wanting to make sure that they're prepared with talking points specifically around um, in their local area. Um, so I will note that in the um, pre-webinar, pre-lead day webinar, we'll be talking a little bit about some of the materials and where you can access some of that information. But um, I know that we're also putting together some materials for the website. So some of that might also be available there. Is that correct, Becca? Yes. Um, so it depends on, on, you know, we'll have certain maps for certain areas. Um, that are already on the website. Um, maybe I can pull that up. And Tanya, I think we were able to put some of that information on the website, right, already. Um, yes, I don't the think Michigan map is on there. Yeah. So yeah, let's what really, I'm sorry. What prompted my question is um, I've done some work around homelessness advocacy with legislators. And uh, what I found to be impactful is there was a one pager that really had some high level talking points and some specific, sorry, specific initiatives that were already being considered um, for either appropriations or, or voting or things like that. So I just wanted to be sure if there are things that are already in the mix that need to be elevated, that we're amplifying our voice mm -hmm. and speaking with synergy around those efforts. And Mara, you've been working directly on the Lead Education Day, so maybe you can speak to the talking points and materials um, for that. 
Yeah, so Angela, you bring up a great point. All of that will be um, covered. One of the things that um, My Lash is doing is they're putting together like a web page where everything will live. So um, we're going to have like the top three like main talking points or asks that we want to see in the state. Um, and then we'll have other materials as well linked there. So yeah, just like you mentioned, it's to make sure everyone's kind of on the same page and has some information that they can be sharing with offices. Great. Well, we are um, at our time, past our time. So I wanted to thank everybody again for joining us today. Um, I'll stick around for a few more minutes. Uh,